I speak for every person at the Aspen Institute uh, to say that we are overjoyed and over the moon and honored to welcome you to this chapter in the purpose of your life, Dan Porterfield. Well, thank you, Peggy, for that um, lovely introduction, um, at least the first part. The second part, um, and for your leadership uh, with Ruth Katz, uh, with Katie Dresser, your teams, for organizing an extraordinary series of discussions aimed at framing problems and finding solutions. Um, a number of our interns are here now, so I'm gonna give the interns a little bit of secret advice, and that is that when you start a new job, and you get those first speaking opportunities, take the risk of saying what you mean. That's what I'm gonna to try to do today. <laughs> Say what you mean. So the conference organizers have brought in people from all over the world to talk about medical breakthroughs, unpack scientific advances, and examine the transformational promise and risk of technology. One theme you'll hear often over the next few days is disruption for good and for ill. There's an enormous amount of change taking place right now all across the world, from how we provide health care in the US and fight cancer in Africa, to how we harness the power of design thinking and implement strategies to reduce the cost of medicine. We will take you to the cutting edge of genetics, propose novel ways to prevent chronic disease, and share insights about the microbiome. And we'll talk about where the visionaries and venture capitals think we can go next. I love this array of themes. I love the array of backgrounds that we represent. I love the cross-cultural, multidisciplinary, evidence-based, results-oriented methodologies that we employ. It's especially important that we work in a nonpartisan, open-minded way, gathering perspectives inclusively willing to entertain ideas that may not appeal to us, always asking critically if we've drawn enough voices to the table and done so respectfully. I suspect among us here there are a few core convictions that we share. One, for example, is that advances in access and excellence in healthcare offer people of our planet greater quality of life than ever before. And thus, we must keep questioning, keep learning, keep researching, keep discovering, keep sharing the tools and treatments that can enable greater human flourishing. A second conviction is that it's a lot smarter for any society to prevent illnesses than to resort only to treating them. And that it's also a lot smarter to empower people to take care of themselves rather than scrambling around trying to save them and stop the spread of further harm in desperate moments after a preventable calamity. A third conviction is that in every country and culture, successful health systems and strategies will benefit everything else from job quality to learning outcomes, from innovation to gender equity from family stability to job creation, from local empowerment to national security. It's deeply interdependent when our health systems work and when they melt down. One more conviction. Surely we all share the belief that it matters to involve people in their own health care decisions, to give great weight to the choices people make about their lives, to treat cultures as a collection of assets and capabilities and wisdoms, to respect and engage cultural values, and to always bring an ethical sensibility to our conversations about who gets health care and what it is that they get. Those are four convictions. I bet the conviction upon which all those other convictions rest, I suspect, I hope, is that we all believe fundamentally in the dignity and value of each and every human being. All humans are equal. No one is more human than anyone else. We all deserve the opportunity to develop our talents 
to express our faiths, to care for our children and our elders, and to flourish. I would argue that the greatest gift we have for the work that here we call promoting health care equity is our capacity to respect the dignity of all people. And from that essential power that we have as human beings, then to develop the interest and empathy to accompany one another, to try to see with each other's eyes, to bear each other's burdens, to celebrate each other's joys, which also means that we have to say no when one group is being stigmatized or scapegoated or labeled as less than human. I'm a parent. My wife, Karen, is here. Uh, our daughters, Caroline and Sarah, are over there, perhaps drawn here against their will. <laughs> um, this is a paradox. We love our children the most, but we are called to love each other the same. This is a paradox. For me, the answer is not to crumble beneath that contradiction but to try to create the conditions where everybody else's children can live their best lives, just like Karen and I want our children to be able to live to their fullest. This means it's our work to help others build strong communities and good societies, because we believe in each person's human dignity and know the capacity of others to love their families precisely because of the intensity with which we love our own. Because we believe in human dignity, I believe that we should try to avoid picking sides too quickly or seizing upon a ready opportunity to score political points. Because we believe in human dignity, we should go the extra mile to avoid prejudging others' views or sizing up people fast so we can shut them down and take away their seat from the table and negate the experiences they would have shared there. Again, where does this commitment to openness come from? We tolerate or include or embrace or protect views we may not agree with, partly out of practical problem solving, partly out of enlightened self-interest, partly perhaps out of a sense of a social contract, but fundamentally because respecting the dignity of others means we must give them their due. And quite often, our own hearts and minds grow when we do that, even when it takes a strong spine to put up with ideas we wish we didn't have to hear. And this bring, which brings me to this, and thank you for listening, because out of a love for humans and humanity, we work at being here the most inviting, inclusive, nonpartisan leaders and organizations that we can be. And here I'm talking about your organizations and mine, the Aspen Institute. We position ourselves because we make that commitment to openness as necessary and probably rarely and always with thought to speak aloud when we see in the actions of others a denial of human beings' dignity and ability to flourish. For that reason, as a healthcare advocate and as a human being, I believe, for example, that cigarettes should not be marketed to children. I believe that sex should not happen without consent. I believe that guns should be kept out of our schools. And I believe, with Pope Francis and First Lady Laura Bush, that the children at any border should not be taken from their parents and placed in 95 degree heat cages with captors mocking their whales, which is... It's precisely because we admit that we do not have a monopoly on truth 
It's precisely because with humility we protect the greatest range of thought and ideas. It's precisely because we actively seek out contrary views and protect speakers' rights that we can then look without blinking into the face of an atrocity and say, no, not here, not to humans, never again but it's our commitment to the biggest possible table for discussion that allows us then to have that clarity of thought when it's needed. But our core commitment is to openness to ideas and viewpoints and inclusiveness of all type, and then every now and then, occasionally, we simply have to say, this is not consistent with the human dignity that we uphold. One reason why the Spotlight Health Soil is so fertile for growing partnerships and solving problems is that when we talk about health here, we think in very broad terms. Those levers create a lot of common ground on which both audience members and speakers can meet. Together with you, I look forward to a great deal in the coming days. Thank you so much for being a part of Spotlight Health. Thank you very much. <laughs>